Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, activists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. On April 19, 1989, 28 year old Tricia Mealy, a young white investment banker, went for her usual late evening run in Central Park. She was attacked, beaten within an inch of her life, raped, and left to die. It was a difficult period in the city's history, marked by high crime, high racial tension, and urban flight. Within days, five black and Latino teenagers were arrested and charged with the crime, their fates seemingly sealed, no matter what the evidence against them or the lack of it. Writer Sarah Burns has examined the facts surrounding that awful crime and its aftermath, and the justice system that failed both the victim and those teenage boys and their families. The Central Park Five, the untold story behind one of New York City's most infamous crimes, has just been published in paperback by the Vintage Books Division of Random House. Welcome. Thank you. So Sarah, tell me how you came to be interested in this case. Well, I first learned about the story uh, in 2003 when I was uh, working for some civil rights lawyers who are now involved in a civil suit. And I was so fascinated by the case and it seemed to me to be such an interesting way to look at some of the larger issues that were going on both in New York City and in the country um, at that time that I ended up writing my undergraduate thesis about this case and then went on to write the book after that. So you didn't go to work you didn't go to work for them because they were working on the case, but you learned about it because no, you were working. No, I was interested in civil rights law. I was thinking about law school, and I, I went to do go and help them do research, basically, and I, I became really interested in this case through them. And what did you want to accomplish with the book? Well, I think I wanted to tell this story and try to tell it properly for the first time. Um, this had been a huge, sensational media story when it broke, um, but really everyone got it wrong at the time and I think that it, it, it hadn't yet had a fair telling. Um, and also for me it was this really interesting way, as I said, to look at, at some of the larger contexts and try to understand how something like this happens. Now, I'm sure that there were probably a, a bunch of New York journalists who would have loved to, who were interested in writing a book like this. Um, uh, how did you persuade the lawyers in the case and the family, whomever, the principals, to open their files up to you? It, it did take some time uh, to get to know everyone and to convince everyone that I was uh, worthy of telling, trying to tell this story. Um, but I, I spoke to the lawyers and I had, I had some relationship with some of the lawyers work with some of initially, them. and so that certainly helped at the beginning. Um, and then I, I started talking to the five, and they all agreed to participate and, and wanted to be a part of this project. And so that was really the first step. Um, but even still, it was, it was difficult. And you know, some of their family members who were understandably very skeptical of the media, who had treated them so badly in the past, um, it, it took a long time to convince some of them to participate, and others um, chose not to, I think, because of that concern. Because the, so there was, I mean, obviously, the, trying to tell the story again is, you know, reopening a lot of old wounds, not just for the, well, in, in the case of the, the victims, you know, the, the Central Park Five, but I would also think, you know, the, the police, the prosecutors, you're sort of reminding them that they got it wrong. Mm -hmm. How did they respond to your efforts? Well, unfortunately, I wasn't, for the most part, able to talk to the police officers and prosecutors who'd worked on the case because of the civil suit. So they are all named defendants in a lawsuit by the five. And so because of that, they are not able to speak to the press. Um, so that was, that was certainly frustrating to me in researching the book. Um, and uh, I had to rely on statements that they had made before the conviction, before the lawsuit was filed. Um, but when the convictions were vacated, some of those people did make comments about it, and so I was able to learn to some extent what they thought what about they thought. it at that time. Tell me how, how you went about researching the book. Well, I, part of it was I'd, I'd never done anything like this before, and so I had to learn for myself how to interview people and talk to people um, and write in a new style. 
Um, I mainly started by just talking to as many people as I could and reading everything I could get my hands on. I'd already uh, read a lot of the newspaper coverage of the case as part of my research for my college um, studies. And so I relied on that as well as uh, a lot of other. I, I, I talked to people about New York and tried to understand the context for it. I read about 15,000 pages of the trial transcripts and hearing transcripts from the case. Um, really anything I could get my hands on about the case and then also just about the time about New York City in the 1980s. Who were some of the people who were the most helpful to you in your research and who were the some who, who were the most hostile, if that's the right <laughs> word? Um, I wouldn't say that anyone was hostile. I mean, other than the problems I ran into um, in trying to talk to the prosecutors and police officers who were involved and, and no one was hostile, but they mostly just said, I can't talk to you, um, those who I was able to track down. Um, but I, uh, Jim Dwyer at the New York Times, who covered this case, uh, he was actually at Newsday at the time um, and wrote only a little bit about it then, but covered it in 2002 when um, the, the actual perpetrator came forward and confessed, and, and he did a lot of research on the case then, sort of going back and trying to figure out what went wrong. He, and so he's very familiar with the case, and he was a great help to me um, in, in terms of when I was first trying to figure, get the lay of the land, right. um, who to talk to, and all of that. So let's go back and set the scene at the time of the rape, the trial, the convictions. What was New York City like in 1989? I mean, what were the factors that you feel contributed to what happened? Well, I think, you know, it's a, it was a very different city then than it is now, certainly. Um, in the 80s, there was, uh, economically, the city was, was in a different place. You know, there had been this financial crisis in the 70s, and so the city was, was beginning to recover, and in the 80s, you know, Wall Street was doing very well. Um, but I think that in order to recover from the crisis of the 70s, you have this sort of, these devastating cuts to social services that leave this, this widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. And so the um, poverty in the city was, was pretty terrible. And also you have very high crime rates. Um, you also have a crack epidemic that begins in the mid-80s, which increases people's fear and also crime, likely. Those things are, are probably linked. Um, and so you get this, this time when people are afraid and it, it feels like a dangerous place. It's also dirty in a different way. I mean, there's a, there's a grit to the city. The sub, every subway car is covered with graffiti. I mean, people who are here then, I think, will remember it looking and feeling like a very different place. And then on top of that, you have this series of violent incidents that have ratcheted up racial tensions in the city. And so there's also, there's not only this divide between classes, but certainly um, between races as well. Um, you get things like Bernie gets the subway vigilante, um, a middle-aged white man who shoots four black teenagers who are sort of hassling him on the subway. Um, and he's celebrated as a hero by a lot of people in the city, this, the subway vigilante. Um, and you have this series of incidents of, of police um, sort of brutality, essentially, um, with black victims. Eleanor Bumpers is killed by the police as she's being evicted from her home. Um, and there's a number of cases like that. And then you get these cases of white mobs attacking black men and killing them in, in Howard Beach and later in Bensonhurst. And so the city is just um, in turmoil, I would say. You write that immediately after the rape, um, a narrative developed that would eventually override everything else, including most of the, <laughs> including most of the evidence. What was the narrative? Well, it really came from the police, and they picked these kids up, some of them right outside of the park, as they were, so they were in the park that night, and some of them With were a lot, There were a lot then. of kids. There were many kids from... in the park, um, the five among them. Um, and so the police picked them up within, some of them right away and within days, and interrogated them and got these statements within a couple of days. And so they presented this information to the media very quickly as essentially that they had already solved the case. And so they said, this is what happened. And they gave these, you know, timelines of what had happened in the park and um, they, they really laid it all out. Um, this idea that these kids had come in this big group and that they had done these other things, harassing and assaulting. Looking to do 
to cause arm, trouble right. and exactly and you know the word that came to be associated with this was wilding and the police announced to the press that the kids had been out wilding and this is what they called their activities and they were harassing people and assaulting them and that eventually this sort of violence grew and and culminated with this rape um, which they described as a gang rape by at least five of these kids um, and that was that was the story and for the most part people bought it. Bought it. I just want to read Pete Hamill, um, a very respected journalist, I guess he was writing for the New York Post at the time mm -hmm. and, and, and this was the way he put it. Race is part of this demented equation but as usual when we are talking about race we are really talking about class. These kids came into Central Park from the north on Wednesday evening and according to the cops they had a loose plan of battle to go wilding against the rich. The details didn't matter because there was no script, but they were coming downtown from a world of crack, welfare, guns, knives, indifference, and ignorance. They were coming from a land with no fathers. They were coming from schools where cops must guard the doors. They were coming for the anarchic province of the poor. Now, in fact, the, the boys who became the Central Park Five were not on welfare, they were from pretty solid middle class or working class families. Mm -hmm. They had not been in serious, none of them had been in serious trouble with the law before. They were not in, involved in drugs or violence. And yet this narrative somehow attached, how did this narrative attach itself to them? Yeah, well it's interesting. I mean, you know, Pete Hamill, this is, it's, it's very poetic. I mean, it's, it seems like a good story. Um, and I think that's part of it. People, it, it it helped, it somehow helped to explain what was going on. Right. People wanted an explanation. This was such a horrifying crime that people needed to understand how it had happened. And this story of, of them, the, the, this other, right? They were this other. They were from the anarchic province of the poor and it was explained by these terrible conditions in which they lived and it, it, you know, it, it made for a good story and it made for a, I think, a useful explanation and right. people were looking for answers. Right. In my journalism class, I, I, I talk about the, the template that we use to understand uh, and explain the information that we, that we have mm -hmm. uh, to make sense of it. And in this case, it was, you know, the, the, the young black hordes coming down from the north basically to rape our women and steal our bicycles and, and, and people sort of really latched onto that. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Sarah Burns right after the following message. John can hold his daughter. Marilyn can laugh with her sons. Raphael can play with his sister. Gregory can fly. None of this would have been possible without an organ donor. Keep life going. Sign up to be an organ donor today. You can register when you renew your driver's license or online at SaveLivesNewYork.org. The more New Yorkers who sign up, the more lives saved. One of them could be someone you love. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Sarah Burns, author of The Central Park Five, the untold story behind one of New York City's most infamous crimes. It's just been published in paperback by the Vintage Books Division of Random House. In fact, at the time of the rape, uh, the police already had information that suggested or should have suggested that a serial rapist was at large. Um, and, and doing this around the vicinity where this particular rape took place. Um, he had already, in fact, raped two women before he raped the jogger. She was the third, uh, including a woman who had been raped two days just before. And on the night of the jogger's rape, and I didn't know this until I read your book, he actually passed by and spoke to some cops mm -hmm. uh, as he was coming out of the park, having raped mm -hmm. uh, Trisha Mealy, and he was wearing her headset. And yet, this narrative overrode all of that. Yeah, it was such a powerful narrative and people believed it. People wanted to believe it. I think it was easy to believe. And so they really uh, latched onto it and, and stuck with it. I think there was a kind of tunnel vision on the part of the, the police and the prosecutors. And so um, there wasn't really room for them to consider these other possibilities. Right. And so 
as you said, they have, there's a woman who's raped just two days earlier in the northern part of Central Park, not far at all from where Trisha Miley was attacked. And you have these similarities, and, and that victim was able to provide a description that led a police officer investigating that case to discover the name Matias Reyes. Um, and so they, I think they could have found him then. They could have prevented these other rapes that he committed after the Central Park jogger. Um, but they weren't looking for him because they were so convinced that this version of the story, that these kids had gang raped this woman, they were so sure that that was the story that they didn't look elsewhere. So you had this, this media frenzy that followed the rape. Um, words and images, very derogatory and inflammatory, wilding, wolf pack, um, animals. Um, where, where did, you know, I've often wondered where the term wilding came from, because we'd never heard it before, the Central Park Jogger case, and do you have a theory of where it came from? Well, it's somewhat of a mystery, really. Uh, it, it did come from this case. I mean, that was where it, where people really first heard it used in this way. And it came, I mean, it came from the police. The police announced to the press that this is what the kids had called their activities. But they all say that they didn't know this word and they hadn't the said boys, it. And it the wasn't, boys. yeah. The, these kids, they it wasn't a part of their uh, vocabulary. And so, I, you know, I think it came from some kind of misunderstanding. There's one version of that story, and I don't have any proof that this is what it was, but th there's a version of it. Um, in which some of the kids were singing the song Wild Thing by Tone Logue that was popular at the time, um, and the police misheard that and interpreted it as wilding. Another is just a, a sort of related word, more like wylin, which was a, has, a, has a different meaning, is sort of does not connote violence in the same way, um, but that maybe that uh, word somehow became interpreted as wilding. But, Whatever it was, it was sort of somehow lost in translation, and you get the police announcing to everyone that this is what it was called. Was and now it's splashed and... across the the front pages of the right. newspapers. Uh, and I and I sort of thought I sort of thought of it as you know part of this whole narrative thing is not only that do they come from the north, but they are different from us. Their morals are different, and they speak a different language, mm. and they have these different ritu rituals. And one of the things they do is this wilding thing that we don't know anything about, but it's because of who they are and where they come from. Um, even the black press, you write, bought into the idea that the boys were were probably guilty. Well, there was so the. The Amsterdam News and the City Sun in particular, Harlem Papers, um, definitely treated the case very differently. I mean, the coverage was, was not at all the same as what you were seeing in the mainstream daily city papers. Um, but even there, where they were certainly questioning this version of the case, um, and there was, there was a, a completely different sense of what had happened there, including sometimes an emphasis on very alternative theories of the case, like it was her boyfriend and these things that didn't have any facts to back them up either. Um, but even then, there was sometimes coverage in there that suggested asking the same kind of question, well, why did they do it and where can the blame be placed other than on them? But the implication there is that they did do it, but we need to try to explain And perhaps why. it's the racist society with all of its implications. Exactly. That, that, you know, created them. Right, but but in the end, no one really got it right. I mean, there was this spot sort of in between all of these versions of the story, which was they didn't actually do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and no one really found that spot. The most damning evidence against the boys, what seemed to confirm the narrative, was their confessions, um, which were coerced. Mm. Talk about that. Well, they, you know, they brought in these very um, experienced seasoned detectives, the Manhattan North Homicide Squad, to help investigate the case. They believed that the victim would die, and so this was handled as if it could become a homicide. And these detectives are very good at getting confessions. It's what they do, and, and they are talented at it. And so they approached these kids and worked very hard to get confessions from them, and it worked, despite the fact that they hadn't actually committed the crime. Um, they use the tactics that they are trained to use. Um, they, you know, they, it's essentially a version of a good cop, bad cop that we know from you know, TV shows. 
Um, but it's really um, bad cop, good cop. They say, they, they tell you how much trouble you're in. This is how bad it is. They convince you that you are going away for the rest of your life. And we've got the goods. And we've got, got the, the goods. We've got people in the other room telling us that you did it, that you were the ringleader. Um, we have evidence. I mean, in one case, they told a story to one of the um, these guys, Yusuf Salam, that he uh, that they'd found his fingerprints on her pants, which was not true. Which was not true. There were no fingerprints, and they certainly wouldn't have been his. Um, and they basically convince you that you are in the deepest kind of trouble, and then they give you what seems like a way out. So as irrational as it is to suggest that you had done something you hadn't done. In that, in that situation where you are terrified and convinced that you are about to be sent to prison, never go home, never see your family again, that this is actually a good idea. And they all believe that they could be witnesses and that they were just helping out, that they were going to you know, be able to give testimony against someone else. Oh, that guy said I did it? Well, I didn't do it, but I was there and I saw him do it. Right. And I can help you put him away. Right. And they all sort of naively believe that that's what would happen. And they also were detained for a, a long time, so there was an element of fatigue. You'd be yes. there for a long time. You're there, you're hungry. Um, the threatening language, um, some of them were kept from their parents, some of them who were underage were kept from their parents, um, who might have said, stop talking mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and again, you said the, the cops held out the promise that if they would just confess, tell, you know, confess to something that they would release, they'd be able to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, even planted some of the actual facts from the, the crime in the boys' minds. So that sure. they said, yeah, that's what it was like, or you know, that's what I did. W were their Miranda rights violated? Could one say that? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think they were all read their rights, but there's this, I think there's a way of introducing those those rights as a kind of, this is just a formality that we have to get through, and of, of doing it when you don't know that you're in trouble yet. So it's, we just have to tell you this, and then we can go ahead, and, you know, someone who's innocent is, is very likely to waive those rights, to not ask for a lawyer, because they don't realize that they're suspected even. Right, right. Um, I think most New Yorkers were also under the impression that, that the physical evidence against the boys was strong. Mm. But that, in fact, was not the case. Right. The, um, this was the early days of DNA testing. It was a fairly new technology and much less sophisticated than it is today. But they did find a semen sample on the jogger and on an article of her clothing. And initially it was a very weak sample, and so it would have been difficult to make a match. But it was enough of a sample to definitively rule out the five. But the way that it was initially presented, sort of in the media coming from the prosecution, was that it was inconclusive. Because had there been a match, they, they couldn't have made a conclusive match. Um, and so I think that was a not a very accurate way to present so that So it wasn't really inconclusive. It was not a match. It was not, it a, was match. not a match. That was, that was clear. And they actually later found another sample. Which was Which definitely was even not a match. more clearly prove that there was right. no match. Um, but that was, that was at least initially presented as if it were sort of not a real test, even though it had shown from very early on that there was no match. And there was also, there were also some hairs that were found um, on a couple of the teenagers. That were claimed to be consistent with the with jogger's, the jogger's hair. hair. And those were even presented at trial as being consistent with. Right. Um, and this is one of these sort of uh, the, the technology wasn't there to make a, a true match. There's no such thing at that time as a match with hair. They weren't doing DNA tests. They were just looking at it. And so it really wasn't a, a very strong form of evidence. And it turned out years later when they went back and tested those hairs that they were not a match. But the DNA evidence that they, that they had at the time showed that the semen that they found on her did not come from any of the joggers, did not come from her boyfriend, and did not come from any of the five. There actually was a match to her boyfriend on an article of her clothing that was explained clearly. Um, but there was, other than that, there was a single sample. One person, not a group, and it didn't match any of the kids, not only the five, but some of the other kids who had been in the park with them were also tested, and it didn't match any of them.
You mentioned two Newsday columnists, Carol Akers and Jim Dwyer, mm -hmm. at Newsday at the time, and they were my colleagues at the time who, who doubted the evidence. Uh, um, I have to say that I didn't at the time. I mean, I, I wrote two two pieces for Newsday about it. One was the early days, a profile of a couple of boys, which found that they were kind of middle class. Mm -hmm. I think somebody's grandmother took him to church every Sunday. He played mm -hmm. in a church band. They were they were basically from solid middle class mm -hmm. homes. And then I after the first conviction, I wrote a column, you know, I assume, well, they're convicted, they did it, you know, sort of asking, you know, how could, how come nobody's conscience um, stepped in in the course of this crime? Mm. Um, but I have to say that in my case as well, and I did not actually cover the trial per se, but it was the confessions again mm -hmm. that convinced me it was sort of like, uh, why would they, why would they tell on each other if it didn't, and they all point the fingers at each other, if, if, if it wasn't true? So I think that was what, I, I'm happy to, to, to know that a couple of my colleagues, you know, mm -hmm. saw through that. Um, and uh, it makes me question why I didn't, but. Well, I think they were very convincing, those statements. Um, and it is very hard to imagine that you would ever, yourself, admit to something you hadn't, hadn't done. done. And I think it's hard, you know, certainly from the the relative sort of safety of the jury box or the audience, you know, reading it in the newspaper or watching the statements. I mean, they were played on the news, these clips right. of these, these they, they gave videotape statements ultimately at the end so of this long process. How could they not be true? And they were very convincing. Right. We're out of time for now, but I want you to join us next week when we continue the conversation with Sarah Burns author of the Central Park Five, the untold story behind one of New York City's most infamous crimes. It's just been published in paperback by the Vintage Books Division of Random House. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.